Hi there. My name is Aaron Lanterman. I'm a professor of electrical and computer engineering at Georgia Tech, and in this video, I would like to address misconceptions about MOSFETs. In the beginning, there was the vacuum tube triode, a three-terminal device with a plate, a grid, and a cathode, which people would characterize by the voltage between the grid and the cathode. Then there was the bipolar junction transistor, the BJT, shown here in its NPN form, a three-terminal device with a collector, a base, and emitter, somewhat analogous to the plate, the grid, and the cathode of the triode. And people would characterize things by the voltage between the base and the emitter. Then there was the MOSFET, shown here in its in-channel form, a three-terminal device with a drain, a gate, and a source, characterized by a voltage between the gate and the source. The problem is, this last bit with the MOSFET, this is a fiction. It's really a four-terminal device. There's a connection called the bulk. And really, there's not really a drain or a source either. Really, you just have a channel, and you have a terminal on each side of that channel. For something like a vacuum tube, the plate is physically very different than the cathode. The collector is doped differently than the emitter. But on a MOSFET, there's really no difference between those two terminals. The terms drain and source only become meaningful operationally when we apply a potential difference between the two terminals of the channel. Now, discrete MOSFETs will have their bulk tied to one of the terminals, and if we do that, and we use this properly, we can reasonably call one of these terminals the drain and one of them the source. But again, this definition of drain and source is something that we provide. The MOSFET doesn't know that we've done that. So it's up to us to provide a positive potential difference between the drain and the source for those labels to be meaningful. There's nothing stopping you from doing something pathological with this and putting in the voltage the wrong way. Of course, you don't want to do that. Now, for discrete MOSFETs like this, it's reasonable to think about designing in terms of VGS in a way that's analogous to VGK or VBE. Generally, on integrated circuits, MOSFETs don't have their bulk tied to one of the channel terminals like this. That's a separate connection, but it's not really a connection that you can access during the design process. The bulk connection of your NFETs are hooked to your lower power supply rail, and the bulk connection of your PFETs are hooked to your upper power supply rail. The thing is, at this point, VGS isn't really meaningful in the same way as VGK and VBE are. You have to really twist and torture a lot of things in order to try to make this be meaningful. I'll talk about what I mean by this a little bit later. Now, to avoid cluttering up a schematic, people will usually omit that bulk connection, but you need to never forget that it's there and that the bulks of your NFETs are tied to the negative rail and the bulks of your PFETs are tied to the positive rail. Brad Minch is a professor of electrical and computer engineering at Olin College of Engineering. He has a slide deck on his website called Teaching Microelectronics at Olin College, and this class actually looks really awesome. So what I really want to take a look at here is the equations he has for MOSFET characteristics. Ah, here we go. VG represents the voltage at the gate relative to the bulk, and VS represents the voltage at the source relative to the bulk. So the equation shown here is probably the kind you're most familiar with in that it has a square law. This is the strong inversion region. This is also called above threshold. Now, most courses will describe this region as just off, and they'll say that the current's zero. But there really is a current flowing. In this weak inversion case, also known as subthreshold, the MOSFET exhibits an exponential characteristic, kind of like BJTs. The formula given above here is a really complicated formula called the EKV model that reduces to these two cases at the extremes. In these formulas, IS is called the specific current, VT0 is the threshold voltage, 
and kappa is a parameter that's called the reciprocal of the subthreshold slope factor. But that's a mouthful, so let's just call it kappa. The thing I want to note here is that this is a little different than the formulas you're probably used to seeing. Notice kappa is multiplying vg, but it's not multiplying vs. So in this formula, vgs equals vg minus vs isn't really a meaningful thing. But people desperately want VGS to be a meaningful thing so they can use their analogies with VBE and going back further, VGK. They'll write a formula with VGS minus a threshold, but they'll make that threshold a function of the source to base voltage. I think that makes things more complicated than they need to be and obscures the underlying nature of the MOSFET. But nearly every textbook I've seen does this. Just leave the threshold fixed and embrace the fact that the MOSFET responds differently to changes in voltage at the gate than it does to changes in voltage at the source. Don't try to hide it. I was introduced to this concept by my colleague Jennifer Hassler. Jennifer was a PhD student of Carver Mead, who takes this approach in his book Analog VLSI and Neural Systems. This semester, Professor Hassler is teaching a class on analog integrated circuit design. Let's go to our website, click on Topic Outline, and click on the first project. If we scroll down a little bit, there are some interesting notes. Remember that the source and drain terminals, which are interchangeable in terms of their operation, have a direct connection to their part of the band diagram. The gate terminal couples to the surface potential, the middle of the band diagram, through a capacitive divider where the attenuation is kappa. Therefore, VG has a different coupling effect in the device than VS, and as a result, VG equals VG minus VS is never valid for bulk devices except for the rare case when we tie the substrate to the source. The origin of the VGS term goes back to discrete devices where three terminals was easier to handle than four terminals. These approaches were trying to translate existing approaches used for older BGAT transistors and vacuum tubes for these new devices. For modern, i.e. anything in the last 30 years devices, one cannot make these assumptions unless the designer pays additional cost and design time. Therefore, although most textbooks have a lazy view of IC design, it is better from the beginning to understand things correctly. These understandings will make circuit analysis easier in the long run. Jennifer also teaches a class called Neuromorphic Analog VLSI Circuits that makes extensive use of field programmable analog arrays that use floating gate technology. So I would recommend that you check out Jennifer's website to learn more about these things. And I've been documenting my own explorations in a playlist titled Adventures in FPAAs. But the place on YouTube you really want to go is Professor Hassler's own YouTube channel. There's all sorts of materials here for all kinds of different classes that she teaches. Brad Bench of the Olin College of Engineering also has quite a few videos on YouTube, I particularly recommend checking out the playlist for his Introduction to Microelectronic Circuits class, as well as his lectures on VLSI circuit design. Before I close out this video, or more to the point before somebody mentions this in the comments, yes, there's some weird specialized MOSFETs that are asymmetric by construction. I'm just talking about your garden variety MOSFET. 